So recently a question came up about how to um, wrap a ribbon-like object around another object. So as if you had like a, a, a paper label that you wanted to animate wrapping around something. And so uh, there are a number of ways you could do this, uh, but there's an old sort of old-fashioned Maya way that does this pretty well, although it can be a little bit finicky, and that's using a, a path, a motion path, and something called the flow path object. So we'll look at setting this up right now, but just to give you a preview, um, we've got something like this, wrapping around an object. And so a few things to take note of here is that I had to create a curve, and I'm not going to bother going into that. I just used my uh, create curve tools, CV curve, and then just drew it and moved the, the uh, control vertices to where I wanted them. You could make a spiral curve and then deform it with a, a bend, but of course it's going to vary from case to case, so there's no point really in going through that. But just a couple things to take note of. Uh, I started the curve early, so I could control the path. Um, and you'll notice that when it goes to the end here, it gets a little janky uh, here. We watch it you see how jiggly it is um, and it'd probably be better actually if I had continued the curve out here to control that animation as it is uh, for the purpose of the animation here I would actually animate it only part way through and stop it something like that I want to use this as sort of a like a ticker tape or a ribbon that goes around and then leaving it like this to use this to label this object here um, another thing you should notice is that um, in this object here, the ribbon, um, my pivot point is still in the middle. Uh, I tried doing this with the pivot point at the end, and it kept giving me problems, and I'm not sure why. So um, you can try it both ways, but uh, I'll show you how to set this up uh, this way first, and then you can take a look uh, at the at other ways of setting up to see what kind of problems we run into. So for now, I'm just going to hide this. And I have another ribbon here, just under the ground here, so they raised my floor a little bit. Uh, but one thing to make note of is that because this is an object that has to deform, I've got lots of divisions in here. Um, I think there are 80 divisions since it has to wrap around. So it's just a common thing when you deform an object, if it has to change its shape a lot, it needs lots of divisions, more resolution. So I'll just use this same curve. So I've got my ribbon selected and I'm going to shift select the curve. So this one is already a motion path from the previous example. So just ignore these numbers here right now. Normally this would be uh, just a, a normal curve to start. One thing to make sure of though, is that your, your curve starts in the direction where you want it to start. So um, here you can see at the beginning of the curve, there's it's hard to see now because the motion path is there, but there's an unfilled square control vertex. That means that's the start of the curve. You can also recognize it because the next control vertex is shaped like a U where all the other ones are just small circles because the motion path will determine that this is the beginning of the path because this is the origin of the um, curve. Okay, so let's do that again. To select my ribbon and select the curve and then we'll go to constrain which can be found in the animation menu set constrain motion path attached to motion path and I'll just open up the options so mine is just set to time slider but of course you could change it the start and end here mine is set to follow so it will rotate as it goes around here you've got to set the front axis and this is the local axis um, so for me, here's my, let me just go into one mode again. So here, my front axis is going to be the red arrow, so X. 
And then my up axis in this case, and my local up axis should be Z. So I'm going to change that here. And then the world up is by default set to a vector, which is zero in X, one in Y, zero in Z. So it's going to point up in the world Y direction. And then in this case, I want to inverse the front. I guess I don't have to, it would just flip it around, but you can see X is pointing in this way and I want to inverse it, so invert it. So it will point in the other direction. So I'll just attach this, and now it just acts like a regular motion path. All right, so it's just the pivot point is on the motion path, so we're seeing this, and it's rotating because we have follow turned on. If we go into the motion path and turn off follow, then it will just act like this, and I shouldn't have done it then. I should have done it. Uh, at the beginning because it inherited its rotation at that point. But you can see it doesn't rotate when follow is turned off. So you can just as a note, um, if I with follow turned on in the transform node of the ribbon shape here, rotate X, Y, and Z um, will be, have an input coming in. And if we go in and turn follow off, then the rotate X, Y, and Z no longer has an input. So you could control the rotation separately if you turn follow off. And that's sometimes useful if you want more control over the movement of your, the rotation of your object as it moves uh, along a curve. And a case when you might want that is if you want something aiming at something external. And so you might have an aim constraint. So this ribbon is pointing at something else that you could animate. But you'd have to make sure follow was turned off because then there would be, if you didn't, there'd be an argument between what's controlling the rotate. Okay, so I'm just gonna turn that back on. And another thing to be aware of, if we go into the graph editor here. So the, what the motion path does is it sets a key for the value um, along the curve. So at frame one, it's at a value of zero along the curve, and that's called the motion path U value. And then as time goes on, so in the X axis, time's pa time passes. And then by the time we get to the end of the, whatever time we set, for me, it was 200 frames. Um, then we get to the end of the curve. So U equals one. But you can see that there's interpolation between these values. So it eases out and then it eases in. So if that's what you want, that's great. And in fact, that's what I do want here. But you could select these keyframes and change them. You know, you could go to linear and it will just have a constant uh, velocity throughout. You can go back to ease in and ease out. And you can also go to curves and go to weighted tangents if you want, if you want to change the nature of the interpolation. So there is more control that you can have over this. And in fact, you could even add more keyframes if you want. So this is the over time, the change in the U value along the curve. So how far it gets along the curve. Um, so if we could go in and insert keyframes here, you know, do something like this, and then we will get uh, what you would expect. It's going to go forward, then start to go backwards, and then forward again as it goes through this curve. And another common question about using motion paths is, well, how do you control the speed that it moves along? And the speed is controlled by um, the time between the zero value uh, on the curve the U value on the curve and the full one value on the curve. So if you want to go faster, it just has to get to this point earlier and this will make it go faster. If you want it to go slower, then you drag that out farther. So it just takes longer for it to get along the, to, to move along the curve. Okay, so let's see. So I'd really emphasize the ease in then it goes really fast and then it or sorry, ease out, then it eases in again. So let's just leave it like that. So now you can see it's moving along, but it's not deforming to uh, match the shape of the curve. And that's where we use the flow path object for this. So here you just want to select the um, 
the moving object, not the curve, just the moving object, and go to Constrain, Motion Paths, Flow Path Object. I'm going to open up the options here. And you can have the lattice be built around the curve. It doesn't always seem to work that well. Uh, for me, I think usually the better uh, option is to lattice around the object. So lattice is an FFD, a free form deformer. And so it, it's a, it essentially builds a low resolution cage around this object that can deform the object within it. And so here you can see the divisions along the front. So the direction that we've defined is the front, which is X for us, then up and side. So we need at least two divisions and up and side, and probably no more uh, to keep things simple. And then divisions in front, it has to be more than five. I'll leave it at five just so you can see. So if I click flow now, so now you can see it's it's not divided enough to deform properly. But we can still go into the FFD lattice shape, so the freeform deformer to lattice shape. I've got a previous one here. You'll notice there's <clears throat> the FFD2, there's the FFD2 base. The base is um, in any deformer, well, in a lattice deformer anyway, is the the reference object. So this records what the deformer looks like before it's animated or changed. And so it evaluates the difference between the base shape and the lattice shape um, to deform the object within it. So anyway, just leave the base alone. But we can change the FFD2 lattice shape. So S divisions, so this was the front divisions. We can change this to something higher. I'm going to change mine to 160. So you can see there are lots of divisions here. I could change it just to 80 because that's how many divisions I actually have in my ribbon. So let's leave it at 80 and see what it's like. That's pretty good. But if we look here, you can see it's kind of diverging away from this and it's clipping a little bit here. So you can only change these divisions at the point before any deformation has happened. At least that's how normal lattices work. So I'm going to change it to 160. Let's just see if that's any better. Yeah, that looks better. So you can see how it's the shape is still diverging away from this a little bit, but it's it's pretty good. It's pretty close. And we're not getting... Oh, no, we, we will get some of that same clipping. So we can fix that um, because there's still history here. If I just go select this curve and go to control vertices, just grab this end one. You know, I can I can change the shape of the curve now and alter the path of the motion. So still do that. So now if we go back, play the animation, something like that. It's pretty good. Okay, so now if I want the animation to end here rather than carrying on like this, so I could have made my curve actually do that, I guess. Uh, but no, maybe I couldn't actually. So I just have to go into the graph editor and add some, add a keyframe and make a change to another one. So we'll go into um, Windows, Animation Editor, Graph Editor. And if you have the motion path selected, it should come up. But a lot of the time, that doesn't work. If we just have the curve selected, for example, uh, you won't see any animation curves here. So if we go into the attribute editor and click on select here for the motion path, then it will bring it up in the uh, graph editor. Yes. Okay. So, so let's see. I'll just play through and see where I want this to end. So let's say something like this. So around frame 114, 
I want the animation to come to an end. So I'll select the uh, the animation curve for U value in the motion path here, and then click on the insert keyframe tool. And then, so you select, oh, okay, that's a little different. So then you can just click on here and add a keyframe at that point. Um, make sure it's actually right on a keyframe rather than like a half frame or anything. And so there's the value at this point in time. And this is where I want it to stop. So I'm actually just gonna hit Q to get out of that tool. Okay, that did not work. I'm going to hit W to get on that tool and just delete the last keyframe. So now if we just move this out of the way, play the animation. So now it just stops there. The interpolation is not that great. Um, I want it to, it just goes linearly into this point. So I'm just going to take this one and uh, What's this called? Well, ease in to this position. So that's better. There's a bit of a bump at the end there, but, um, and if I want to make this take longer, I can drag this value later in time but not change the value up and down so the U value stays the same. So it just goes a little more slowly. Yes, yeah, so there's a little bit of a judder there where uh, it's not, I guess it's exiting the curve. So that would be maybe another reason to extend the curve a little bit. So that's about it. Um, I was going to talk about setting the the um, the pivot point at different parts, but actually I don't see the purpose in doing that. This is working the way that we want it to um, without moving the pivot point. So this can be used for lots of different things. Um, there are still a few things. This probably won't. Yeah, this doesn't do anything. I'm looking at the motion path, the front twist, things like that. Uh, you can see my thing is inside out right now. I just noticed that. So I'm going to click on inverse up. So it just flips it around. Um, you can turn on bank and this makes it sort of pivot around the, um, the curve, uh, like a plane flying and making a tight turn. It's going to bank. Um, I don't know if these things work now with that. No. So you can change the bank limit if you want. So there's some control over this. There's no real uh, rotate like you would have with an IK handle or something. But for me, it works better without bank to give me the effect that I want. Um, but you can alter these things to your own needs. Anyway, I hope you find that helpful and uh, see you in the next tutorial.